The Lord be with you. Welcome to worship on this Lord's Day, and please know that you are all welcome. Those of you who are tuning in uh, as members and friends of First Presbyterian Church, those of you who may be tuning in from your safe place, wherever it may be in the world, uh, know that our worship together today is enriched and made complete by your presence, by your participation, and I hope you will indeed uh, participate. Uh, follow the bulletin along and, and the liturgies and all of that. I want to encourage uh, folks in Worcester to come down on the square uh, each day, Monday through Saturday, 12 to 1, where the uh, continuing vigil in support of Black Lives Matter is, is, go is ongoing. And then on Sundays, people of faith gather 10.30 to 12, and we have um, a time of meditation and a time of silence and uh, fellowship down there together as we uh, make, uh, keep the vigil going uh, as persons of faith. So just know you are invited to join those gatherings whenever you can. I did want to mention in, in a, on a pastoral care note that this past week we lost a wonderful, wonderful member of our church, Mary Jane Beam. And so we want to keep Carol and uh, Gary Thompson in our thoughts and prayers and their extended family as well. Uh, there are no services, of course, at this time, but uh, there will come a day when we can gather and celebrate uh, Mary Jane's wonderful life. The beautiful flowers that you will see this morning beside the pulpit uh, are given by our very own Amy Backstrom and her family. Uh, Amy is our director of family ministries and she gives these wonderful uh, children's moments uh, each and every Sunday. And the flowers today are in celebration of their daughter Sophia's 15th birthday, which actually occurs today the 9th of August. So to Sophia we say happy birthday and um, boy it'll be sweet 16 next year and I'm sure mom and dad are going to feel that one. Now let us prepare our hearts to worship God. Good morning. The composers of the two organ pieces this morning are both 20th century British gentlemen. First of all, Edward Elgar, whom you may know as the composer of the Pomp and Circumstance marches, or maybe the Enigma variations. As a small boy, he watched his father play the organ at a Catholic church and eventually took over that position. One of his early compositions was entitled Vesper Voluntaries, and it was also one of his first uh, commercial compositions. The other organ composer is also a Brit, George Dyson, lesser known 20th century uh, he was the first director of the Royal College of Music who had previously been a student there. And this is his voluntary or postlude in D major. Finally, for our musical offering today, I'm very happy to welcome back my friend and colleague, Ann Giancola from St. Mary's, just across the street. One of the silver linings of uh, our current method of worship is that I can pull in Ann from the Catholic Church when she would not be available to us on Sunday mornings, so it's great to have her back. The piece of music she's singing today is a setting of Rejoice in the Lord, which draws most of its text from Paul's letter to the Philippians, and it seems particularly timely today and in this season when Paul suggests to us that we focus on what is good and what is just and think on those things. The composer is Richard Lane, who was a graduate of the Eastman School and a lifelong resident of New Jersey. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Elizabeth Stockton Perkins, and I'm here to give you one final update about the fundraiser concert that Cameron Edmiston and I put together for Presbyterian Disaster Assistance. As of today, we have raised over $1,500 which was a complete surprise and really encouraging and exciting for us. It totally blew my goal out of the water. Thank you so much for your support of Cameron and me and for your support of disaster assistance around the world. We really appreciate it. 
And if you did miss the premiere of the concert on Saturday, it is not too late to make a contribution and to enjoy our music. So feel free to email me at presbyteriancookies at gmail.com with any questions if you still want to participate. Maybe we can get to $2,000. Thank you.
I invite you to join me in our call to worship. Jesus comes to us, showing us how to do the unlikely. Come, Jesus says, trust God. Jesus calls us to leave the boat, to risk the waves. Come, Jesus says, trust God. Jesus calls us to rise from quiet prayer, to risk the storms of faithful witness to God's justice and mercy and reconciliation. Come, Jesus says, trust God. Jesus calls us to rise from the heaviness of doubt to risk the joy of faith. In our worship this day, let us come to trust and rejoice in God. Let us pray. God of safety and of risk, you who call us over and over to leave what is familiar and comfortable and go out to places where the spirit blows wild and wonderful winds of change. Give us the courage today to journey where your breath will send us, flying in new directions, led by your transforming love. Amen. Please join in our prayer of confession. There are times when we feel cast down, lost in deep places, abandoned and alone. Come to us, O God, when fear overtakes us. There are times when we lash out in anger, seeking revenge for the ills of the world and others. Come to us, O God, when fear controls us. There are times when we come to our wit's end, not knowing where to turn. Come to us, O God, when fear disorients us. In this time, give us strength and courage to release our fears to you, O God, in hope of transformation and a renewed sense of purpose. Gracious God, hear our prayers. Amen. Hear this good news of grace. God does not abandon us to our fears. God comes to us. God journeys with us. And God can be trusted, even when all seems lost. Friends, receive this good news. We are forgiven and made whole. Be at peace with God and with one another. Thanks be to God. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Hello. I want to talk to you a little bit about how we can give to others. When we are in a church, you might see the adults pass around our offering plates. And sometimes they put in change and money, and sometimes they put in envelopes that maybe has a check in it. Sometimes they use their credit card and do it online, which we now have that option. Sometimes they don't have money to give, and so they offer up other ways to give. You can give to your church in all, in all kinds of service ways. You can help plant flowers and rake leaves and pull weeds outside. You can help clean and serve as ushers and greeters, sing in the choir, help with the children and youth ministry, teach a Sunday school class. There's all kinds of ways that we can serve. We can help cook a meal for other people. When we do those things, we are a blessing to other people. When we're pulling weeds outside, it's not for the people that go to our church to see, it is for all of our community to see what a wonderful place we have in our church. When we click on the link and we see our worship service and we see all the people who have volunteered their time to do a liturgy, to do a children's message, to preach the sermon, to sing a song, to play the piano or the organ, those people are blessing others' lives. And they themselves have been blessed by God. 
I have been blessed by countless emails from friends and family from far away that are watching our, sh our services. I have been blessed by my own family, by friends in different ways. And sometimes we're hearing God say, you are blessed in times that we don't always feel blessed, especially right now. It's hard to hear God saying, look at the blessings around you when we're feeling like everything's been taken away from us right now. It's hard to notice the good things in life when things look bad. But we know that God is out there. He is blessing us every single day with breath of life. And he wants to bless us so that we can bless others. So I wanna hear from you, how can you be a blessing to other people? And how have you been blessed in the last couple of weeks? Hello girls. How have you felt blessed lately? I have been feeling blessed by God when I am reading books. I feel blessed when I get to play with my friends socially distant. And how have you been a blessing to others? And I've been helping out with chores around the house. So Addie, how have you felt blessed lately? That my family and friends are safe and healthy and that I have people around me that I can play with and love and care for. <laughs> and how have you been a blessing to others? That I make people smile and be happy every day and I help people when they're sad and I'm helpful at home when they need stuff. I've been blessed with great health and that how my family's had great health and I've been able to spend a lot of time with them. And then I've blessed other people by making them laugh and giving hugs when needed. Thank you for sharing those ways that you have been a blessing to others. It is always great to hear how our children and families bless other people. We oftentimes think only adults can serve the church and only the adults can show their faith. But our children and our youth and our young people are such a blessing in the lives of so many people in our community. And we want you to know that and we want you to feel the love of Christ every time that you're out and about. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for making me a blessing to somebody else, encouraging me to bless those people with my gifts. Help me to listen and guide me in those ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We come now to our time of prayer. As we bow our heads and close our eyes, let us also focus our minds, open our spirits to God, to whom we speak, the one whom we love and trust. Let us pray together. O oh God, so far beyond our imaginations, yet incredibly close to each of us, hear us as we come to you today. As this pandemic swirls about us like a vicious hurricane, threatening to pull us away from our moorings, exposing us to the harsh elements of fear and uncertainty, of separation and loneliness, rearranging and reordering our lives in ways we could never have imagined, we have become more and more aware of the power, the power to dislocate, the power to destroy, the power to dominate. But as we draw near to you together in worship and spend time together in prayer, we become aware again of some of the very different kinds of power. We become aware again of the power of caring. Caring which magically transforms our thoughts and transfers the focus of our thoughts from ourselves to others, seeking ways of easing the pain of others, of providing support, of blessing others with encouraging smiles and a strong hand and a word of comfort 
that brings a lightness of spirit which can part the clouds of despondency and dis-ease and release the weight of heavy thought. What power there is in caring. We think today of the power of truth that blows the strong and simple force of fact through the cobwebs of fictitious reality and reveals the real vibrant colors that have been diluted and altered by the stale and noxious air of pretension and falsehood. What power there is in simple truth. We think of the power of love that trims away the brittle branches of hatred and reveals the central core of life that can grow and blossom and flourish anywhere, that can change all that surrounds us, bringing newness and possibility and the beauty of godly likeness, of the most forgotten and seemingly hopeless of places. What power there is in love. We remember as we spend time with you in prayer, that this power, the power of caring and truth and love, all the powers you make available to us can be ours as we become closer to what you have designed us to be. All around us, even in the most destitute of places, in the most difficult of times, even among us, especially among us, there are budding saints People who have caught the life-giving, life-loving, life-saving, divine bug that we all have within us. Leaning on each other, learning from each other, sharing with each other, we learn to see through the imperfections that we all possess. Learning from your son, we develop eyes that see beyond the skin-deep differences the cultural disparities, the age dissimilarities, all the interesting but unimportant distinctions, to see to the core of our beings, where we have set our course to become ever more faithful disciples of our Lord, letting go of all that separates us from our Master, dropping along the way all the silly and sinful inclinations, and holding on to each other in this great fellowship of followers as we move on our way through this difficult and life-sucking pandemic with the promises of our God as our guide. We hold before you today the family of our beloved Mary Jane Bean as we remember in your presence Ken Starling and all members of this who have special need today. Depending on your presence among us, we remember today the ancient words of wisdom from the prophet Isaiah, who reminds us again that while we will not be saved from the difficulties of life, we can depend on God to be with us always, helping us to live faithfully, usefully, victoriously. Thus says the Lord, the one who created you, O Jacob, the one who formed you, O Israel. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. This, gracious God, this we believe, and this we proclaim, as we pray in confidence the words we learned as children and have repeated throughout our lives, the words Jesus teaches us again today as we pray in our separate homes, but together as one family. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Gospel lesson for today comes from the 14th chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew. And the 14th chapter is uh, full of, uh, well, it has two stories that are very well known if we uh, read around in our Gospels. And it starts out with uh, the murder, execution, if you will, of John the Baptist. Then it moves into the feeding of the 5,000 and closes with our passage for today, which is known as Jesus Walks on the Water. So I invite you to join me as we begin Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 36. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, Jesus came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately... Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, 
started walking on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret. After the people of that place recognized him, they sent word throughout the region and brought all who were sick to him and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. Well, what can we think after entering our sixth month of pandemic meltdown? So far, I haven't heard of infection touching our immediate circle, but we can't see how close it is hovering. To me, these months have evaporated, but I can't feel that I have much to show for it. Thankfully, the weather has been, for the most part, fair here in Northeast Ohio. But I realized this past week that I only need three to five rainy days to plunge me into a weather depression. We all have family and vacation destinations that we are desperate to visit, and yet we recognize that any wider contact, contact has serious risks. And through all of this, summer is passing too quickly through our fingers, and the anticipation of fall brings its own unknown threats. I don't suppose I am, I am alone in these feelings. Summertime usually has a special quality about it, with its warm sunshine and lengthy days stretching into leisurely evenings, its anticipated vacations and visits with relatives, the memories of carefree youth gone by. I suspect many of us have more than a touch of sadness at this summer's passing. And then, in the midst of my musings over this unusual but inevitable drift into the season of autumn, I encountered this well-known gospel story of Jesus walking on the water, the gospel lesson for today. This biblical passage seems to have its own pensive quality about it. In the previous scene, Jesus was seeking a deserted place to be alone, but the crowds found him and prevailed upon him to share his gifts of healing. Then as evening fell, the crowd was hungry, and Jesus proceeded to provide food for them from a few loaves and two fish. This story continues in today's reading, with Jesus sending the disciples on their way in a boat while he goes up a mountain to pray by himself, alone. Later on that night, while the disciples' boat was struggling against the wind, Jesus appears to them, walking on the water. They were filled with fear, but Jesus admonishes them not to be afraid. At this point, the story gets somewhat complicated. Peter asked to walk on the water toward Jesus. His fellow disciples apparently felt no compunction. They may have been perfectly happy to know that it wasn't a ghost who was addressing them. But Peter's request, Peter's 
daring, if you will, creates a potential rift in their companionship. Does one of them have the faith, the confidence, to step out of the boat onto the obviously liquid, unsupportable surface of the sea while the others remain in relative safety on board? The narrative recounts what happens next. Peter makes it a few tentative steps and then begins to succumb to the inevitable. You can't walk on water. Yet in the story, Jesus reaches out, lifts Peter into the boat, and the storm subsides. Those left in the boat worship him as son of God. All of this leaves me wondering what we might make of this that could have any relevance to our lives. Perhaps we begin by digging deeper, moving beyond a simple, improbable miracle story about someone walking on the water. There are two other biblical accounts of this scene that occur in the Gospels of Mark and John, but neither of those two Gospel stories include the dialogue between Peter and Jesus. Peter does not step out of the boat. So, left with Matthew's singular telling, where might we find a word for us? The story begins with Jesus seeking a time and a place for solitude and prayer, or meditation. In contrast to Jesus' example, our contemporary lifestyles are usually saturated with demands on our time. From family commitments to work requirements to social obligations and desires, recovering some space in our schedules for quiet, for reflection, for contemplation could bring healing and wholeness to our spirits, our health, our relationships. The biblical narrative then moves to the boat. Storms and rough seas are familiar to us as we navigate the known and unknown waterways of life, especially in these pandemic times. We should be grateful for fellow travelers like Peter, who are always ready to dive into the waters that swirl with uncertainty. Yet, we must not discount those who remain in the stern of the boat, those who maintain the equilibrium and ballast of the home ship so that spontaneous adventurers have a stable and viable place or boat to which they can return. In this parable story for today, both the one jumping overboard and those who stayed behind experienced a calming of the storm and a safe landing on shore. Perhaps there is a message here of gospel good news for us today. There are some of us who are called to leap off the boat into the royal, roiling waters of injustice and profound need to save all those that can be reached. And there are others of us who are called to stay in the boat to help those who need to be pulled aboard and given a towel and dry clothes and some water and provisions. As this narrative concludes, the storm was calmed for all. They made landfall safely and gifts of healing were brought to desperate people 
who lived beyond the privileged confines of the chosen ones. In the end, we are all invited to take our places and to do the work to which we are uniquely called, knowing that time and space will shape that work as we journey through life. And speaking of our own journeys, poet Mary Oliver offers this profound insight in her poem entitled, The Journey. One day, you finally knew what you had to do and began, though the voices around you kept shouting their bad advice, though the whole house began to tremble and you felt the old tug at your ankles. Mend my life, each voice cried. But you didn't stop. You knew what you had to do, though the wind pried with its stiff fingers at the very foundations, though their melancholy was terrible. It was already late enough, and a wild night, and the road full of fallen branches and stones. But little by little, as you left their voices behind, the stars began to burn through the sheets of the clouds, and there was a new voice, which you slowly recognized as your own, that kept you company as you strode deeper and deeper into the world, determined to do the only thing you could do, determined to save the only life you could save. In our personal and corporate lives, especially as we are confronted with the twin pandemics of COVID-19 and the profound realization of the systemic racism that continues to grip our nation, it is my hope that we move beyond the crippling, paralyzing tentacles of storm-filled fears and into the calm waters of a spirit-infused faith. A faith that boldly declares that the future is held in divine hands a faithful stance that calls us to decisive action that we may embody and maintain even beyond our lingering apprehensions. Amen.
Oh, use me, Lord. Use even me. Wherever you will and when and where, I hope as we continue our journeys of faith, together individual, I mean individually and together corporately, I hope that we will sense that we're finding our places. I hope we will be finding our voices to do and to say and to speak and to act healing and wholeness, making peace, making one, making welcome to all. It is in this season when we are so impinged upon by the fear of a deadly disease we still know so little about and certainly cannot predict. When we are struggling mightily as a country and a society with the endemic racism, that we must work, we must work to undo. Not only for our sakes, but for the sakes of the future generations that follow us. Let us step up. Let us truly pray the Lord will use you, even me. As you leave the sanctuary this day, go knowing that you are embraced in the steadfast love of God forever, that you are redeemed in the grace of Jesus Christ now and always and that together we are being empowered for faithful witness and loving service this and every day of our lives. And may God's hope, peace, joy, and love enfold you this day and carry you through the week. Amen.